Good morning, everybody. It's good to see y'all here this morning. Good to see you, sir. Y'all know this song. Y'all sing it with me this morning. So we get started. The words will be on the screen here. The Lion and the Lamb. And he is coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the king. Oh, the God who comes to save, he's here to set the captives free. Yes, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's a roaring with power and fighting our battles in every need for battle. bow before the lion and the lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before him. Oh, now this part, y'all can sing it along with me. It's easy to catch on to you. It just says, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Will y'all sing this with me? It goes like this. Yeah, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Say, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yes, who can stop the Lord? you give the Lord a clap offering this morning. It's good to see you guys here this morning. Thank y'all for being here this morning at this nine o'clock hour. Uh, so welcome to Grace Works Church this morning. I see mostly familiar faces out here right now, but I know that we probably have some guests in the crowd. So uh, thank y'all for being here with us this morning. Also, I know that we have a Facebook Live audience that is joining us right now. So thank you for joining us this morning. If you have your mobile device on you right now, uh, you can hit the share button and share it out there on Facebook so others can and, uh, watch along uh, with us this morning. 
And uh, But if you are a guest and you are here this morning, or you've been kind of visiting with us some and you haven't decided you're going to join just yet or anything like that, we have some uh, visitor's cards out here in the lobby, in the foyer that you guys can fill out after the service just so we can know that you're here with us uh, this morning and we can uh, reach out to you and say hello. But uh, thank you all again for being here this morning. And uh, we're going to get started singing here this morning. It's uh, what this week is Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm in this mood of just singing praise praises this morning and I was picking this song out somebody said that's an Easter song that you're singing but uh but you know what it just was the man I just would yeah I was excited about singing this song this morning so if you guys would take a moment to just stand up for a second may, maybe get out in the aisles you have enough room to get out there and wave at somebody this morning if you're on Facebook hit the like button hit the wave hit the hearts whatever y'all wave get a good wave at everybody this morning let's sing this together Sing Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high.
a seat for just a moment here, and we're going to continue singing. You know, I, I, I think, uh, I can't remember how long ago, it's been over a month ago, that I started planning this service and just thinking about how many songs that I like to sing on that Sunday before Thanksgiving, and I actually forgot about this song, and uh, Pat reminded me of it, and it's the perfect song as we go into Thanksgiving, singing my tribute to God be the glory. We all sing this with us.
you give the Lord a clap offering this morning? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Father, thank you for your word this morning. And today we bless you with all that we have and all that we are. In Christ's name. Would you guys just take a moment right now where you are to bow your heads and close your eyes and talk to the Lord and thank Him for something this morning in this Thanksgiving season.
God, we thank you that we can come here this morning, that we can sing these songs of praise to you. God, we thank you for this Thanksgiving season. And God, we return all the thanks and all the praise back to you this morning. May everything that we say and do honor and glorify your name. And it is my privilege this morning to speak on behalf of everyone in this room and everyone who may be watching online this morning. God, when I tell you we love you, we thank you for the gift of salvation we have through Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Well, um, it has been an unprecedented year. Crazy. With all the... the this stuff? Yeah. It's unprecedented how many times we've actually heard the word unprecedented. <laughs> Our dream vacation was canceled. You got to keep the job you don't like. You know they can see you? But well, let me tell you all the no's, friends. Um, no going to restaurants, no movie theaters, no movie theater popcorn, no state parks, no going to athletic events, no church services, and no... Don't say it. Don't. Hey, kids! You've got to be more careful with the toilet paper! This is all we have. All the drive-by birthday parties, graduations, <laughs> baby showers. I will say this, I felt a little awkward throwing out that baby shower gift in the front yard. You weren't supposed to do that. It just feels like a wasted year. I said it, I said it. Yeah, there's just all the time at home. Boom! And all the time that we were made to spend together. Hey, honey. All the heart-to-hearts. Mm. Goodness. Speaking of hearts, our son, Jason, right over there, said yes to Jesus. Right at that kitchen table. July 17th, 2020. You know, I guess it's not really wasted time because God didn't waste a moment of it. <laughs> I think I have the answer to what I'm thankful for. Yeah? Yeah. What is it? Everything. Everything. God does not waste time. And he hasn't wasted a moment in the year 2020. The psalmist in Psalm 32, 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This month of November, it's been our goal, as we've shared with you from God's Word, as we've come together for worship, our goal has to been to cultivate a heart of gratitude. It's been our goal to grow in our thankfulness. We've been looking at the Psalms and looking beyond just circumstances, but we've been looking to God and how we can find one who is never changing, one who is consistent, one who we can always count on. And there we find the source of our gratitude. I realize it's not Christmas yet, but we've had plenty of time at my house and so we've already decorated the Christmas tree, decorated the house, and we've even started wrapping gifts. I'd like to share a little Christmas idea from the Leonard family tradition. Usually when we give gifts and exchange gifts, without exception, there's always this one gift that's given, and the giver says, let me explain. It's that one gift you open up and you're like, that was not on my wish list. You open up that gift and you go, I'm not sure I ever wanted this. It's that one gift that the giver says, let me explain. Well, that's today's Thanksgiving sermon. Let me explain. Stay with me. You'll get it in a few minutes. It's not your typical Thanksgiving message. It's probably not going to be the...
message you expected or the, the warm message you would like to hear, your typical Thanksgiving message. But as you will stay with me for a few minutes, you'll see how we can be a grateful people. Truly grateful and have a heart full of gratitude. So, what do we have to be thankful for in the year 2020? In a world of hurt, of crisis, of hardships, what is it that you're thankful for? What does your list of thankfulness look like? Instead of being thankful, unfortunately, we go back and we find ourselves being drawn to the idea of being ungrateful. Instead of being grateful, we might find ourselves just throwing in the towel, giving up, and showing hopeless resignation. We might find ourselves focusing on the suffering, focusing on the hardship, rather than focusing on God. And we might even find ourselves becoming bitter for what we've experienced. It closes ourselves to God's grace. It becomes poisonous to us. And instead of focusing on God, we focus on that. And that becomes the idol, the hardship, the crisis becomes that that draws all of our attention. That's the whole purpose this, this month from preaching and sharing from God's Word. That we not become a hardened people. That we be a very grateful people. That we have a heart full of thankfulness. So, as we focus in on God and what He's done for us and who He is, let me ask you a question. What is the, the often neglected, unappreciated, unused Thanksgiving blessing of God? What is that blessing we often overlook? It's God's forgiveness it's his forgiveness if I go down my list of what I'm thankful for I will say my health I will say my family I will say uh, my job but often I neglect to say I'm thankful for God's forgiveness because when I look at God's forgiveness I have to look and consider my sinfulness and I don't like it when I look at that. But as we look at this idea of God's forgiveness, look with me at Psalm 32. This morning we're looking at Psalm 32, where it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was upon me, heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Say the. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Say la. And therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will counsel you with the eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. As we look to this psalm, a psalm that concludes with rejoicing, with worshiping, let's move back. Let's look back at what he's rejoicing over. For here the psalmist, he writes about experiencing God's forgiveness. So how do I personally, how do I involve myself in this forgiveness? 
The psalmist, looking back to verse 5, he says, in order to experience God's forgiveness, you and I must deal with it. That's right. That's my version of it. Deal with it. Deal with your sinfulness. Acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner. And bring your sins before God. Acknowledging the fact that we're a sinner is not necessarily agreeing, yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I do make mistakes. But it's recognizing the fact I am a sinner and then turning to God with my sins and allowing Him to do something only He could do. Psalm 32, it was recognized as a favorite psalm of St. Augustine. St. Augustine while he lay on his bed dying, he had someone inscribe it on the wall next to his bed. And the whole reason for this was so that he could meditate on it better. His rationale for this particular psalm was the fact that the beginning, he believed the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. And I would take this one step further and I'd say, it's not just acknowledging and realizing you're a sinner, but doing something with it, dealing with that sin. Not just being accepting of a fact, I am a sinner, but it's doing something with it. And if you look back at verses 1 and 2 of the psalm, the psalmist says, blessed. Blessed is the ones whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered who the Lord does not count their iniquity. There's three words I want us to focus on for just a minute. Those words are transgression, sin, and iniquity. And those are not synonyms. They don't all mean the same. And the, the psalmist, the poet, was not just trying to find different words to mean the same thing. For in the Hebrew language, they each mean something different. They give you a better understanding of what it means to be a sinner. When we want to experience God for, for, excuse me, when we want to experience God's forgiveness, we have to deal with our transgressions. And our transgressions, that is that rebellion against God's authority. That's that going away from Him, departing from Him, going against Him. David, in his confession, after he had committed adultery, after he had committed murder, in Psalm 51, he says, against you and only you, God, have I sinned. Notice he didn't say against Bathsheba, who he committed adultery with. He didn't say against Uriah, who he had murdered. But he said, against you, God, I've rebelled against you. He recognized the fact his transgression was a sin against God. But the psalmist says you also have to deal with sin. Sin, it's an it's a archery term. It's to pull back the bow and shoot the arrow and miss the target. To fall short, to overshoot, but to miss that target. And that target is God's law and whenever you and I sin we don't measure up to that standard that you find in his law in his word Paul when he wrote to the church at Rome he said all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but we not only deal with our transgressions and our sin we must deal with our iniquity in the picture here, the word iniquity is one of being twisted, being crooked. This is the, the corruption and the twisting of the right standards. That's the reason when you describe someone who's indulging in sin as being crooked or twisted. The psalmist was saying, you must deal with each. And notice as you look back at these, transgression, sin, and iniquity. Transgression is dealing with our relationship with God. Sin, 
is our relationship with the Word. And iniquity is our relationship with ourself. We must deal with these, acknowledge these, and bring these before God. To not deal with our transgression, sin, and iniquity, verses 3 through 4 says, I wasted away. He says, I wasted away, I was burdened, I was miserable. That's not a great place to be. And that is the person who continues to carry sin around in their life and not deal with it. To deny sin, to repress sin, to suppress sin, that's not the answer. It's an infection within. It must be dealt with. Verse 6 of the psalm. He says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you at a time when you may be found. What is the prayer of the godly? The prayer of the godly is repentance. It's acknowledging my sin. And it's taking it before God. And the reason they are godly is they know they're ungodly. And so they go before God. They turn to Him. And they, in union with Him... They become godly as God deals with our sin and our sinfulness. So, verses 1 and 2, it points us to the idea, how does God deal with this ugly sin? How does He bless? Blessed is a person who experiences this. How does God deal with our sin? How would you like for God to deal with your sin? Well, you know what? Personally, I'd like God to ignore my sin. It's disgusting. It's ugly. We would like God to do that too, wouldn't we? Just just let it go. God, you're big enough. You can handle this. Just turn your head. Don't look at it. We would like God to minimize our sin. Well, Tony, you know, it's not really all that bad what you did. Or Tony... You know, it's not as bad as Brother Bill's sin. (laughs) But we would like for God to deal with our sin in a manner that's easy. We would like God to deal with our sin. Maybe even giving us excuses. Saying, hey, don't worry about it. But the beauty... In this psalm and the beauty in what God does with our sin and the reason that you and I have to be grateful is because God does deal with our sin and look at each of these sinful areas of our life it says in verse 1 blessed is the one whose transgressions blessed is that person for their transgressions are forgiven and this idea here in verse 1 it's The one where he lifts our burden. He takes the burden off of us. As we waste away, as we feel weighted down, God lifts our burden. If you're following along in the sermon notes and the outline, um, you know, I just kind of abbreviated here. And you might just, if you're following along, writing, right out to the side, God lifts our burdens. I left off God. That's the most important part of this. God lifts our burdens. He bears and he carries our load away. I'm 55 years old. When I was 12 years old, I realized I am a sinner. But I went one more step. I said, I know I'm a sinner. God, forgive me. I will never forget that Sunday night in May of 1977. God took my sins. I remember the physical feeling of being weightless as God took my sins. And I'm not prescribing that experience for you, but that was what I experienced when I realized and dealt with my sinfulness. God took the burden from me. Not only does he lift our burden, God covers our sins. He covers our sin. I've got a couple of images I want to share with you here on the screen. And this is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, we don't know where it is. 
This is, uh, these images are artist depictions of what they found in Scripture. And so this is the best they could come up with. So we really don't know for sure exactly what it looks like. But this was placed in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. And one, at one day a year, the Day of Atonement, the priest would go in and take the blood of a sacrifice. And this blood of the sacrifice, do you know where he put it? On the ark. He would sprinkle the blood onto what's known as the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, why is that so significant? Why couldn't the priest just take in that blood and splatter it on the ground and say, we're done with it? There's your sacrifice. There's great significance as you consider these depictions of the Ark of the Covenant. Because that mercy seat, the area between the cherubim, the lid of the Ark, that was where God's presence was said to dwell. And that blood was sprinkled on that lid. Because contained in that Ark of the Covenant, that's right, there was the law. And so that blood covered that broken law. It covered it so that God's wrath, His judgment, would not be placed upon those who broke the law. The same thing is true when Christ died on the cross. His blood was shed so that it would cover my sins, your sins, and we would not experience God's wrath and judgment. That blood has so much significance. It wasn't just that he died, but blood was shed so that you and I might have a relationship with God. He covered the broken law, shielding the sinner from God's judgment. But he doesn't stop there. In God dealing with our sins, it points us to the idea in verse 2 where he deals with our iniquity. God imputes. God does not count against us. This is not a matter of God saying, never mind. It's not a matter of God saying, don't worry about your sins. Do better. No. Here is a, it's a book t- bookkeeping term that he uses. In the Hebrew language, this idea of not counting against us, it's a matter of him saying something has to receive credit for this sin. And so the idea of imputing, it's where he writes in the books, keeping the ledger, he writes in Jesus' ledger, my sins, your sins. And instead, over here, in my ledger, in your ledger, he puts Jesus' righteousness. It's just not a matter of taking an eraser and racing off my sins, no. Imputing means I don't count it against you, but I count it against Jesus. Paul, running to the church at Corinth, says, For our sake he made him... To be sin. He made Jesus to be sin. Who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's right. Your sins, my sins were heaped on him. So that it wasn't counted against us. It was counted against him. But not only does he deal with our sins in such a manner. He also deals with our sins instantaneously. When he deals with my sins and your sins, it's not a matter of him saying, okay, let's see if this works out. Let's give it a little bit of time and see if this forgiveness thing takes. No, it's like that. Several weeks ago, Brother Bill referenced the prodigal son. Remember the story of the young man who took the inheritance, went off into a foreign land, blew his inheritance, ended up working in a pig farm, he goes back home, and he, he decides before he gets home, he comes up with a speech. He says, Father, this is my speech. Father, I've sinned against you in heaven, and I'm no longer to be called your son. Treat me as a hired servant. I can only imagine him running this in his head. 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as a hired servant. Do you know how the story ends? The boy returns home. The father is watching. The father does the unexpected, the unheard of. Takes off running. Meets the son. He embraces the son. The son is getting there. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be treated as your son. What does the father respond with? It's almost as if he didn't even acknowledge it. He knows the father is waiting for him. He is waiting for him to come. And at that point, forgiveness takes place. He says, get the ring, get the fatted calf. We're going to have a celebration. The father is not even acknowledging the fact the son has sinned. It's that quick. God is yearning to hear from us, to forgive us, to fully restore us. It's only if you and I will deal with it, he's going to deal with it. Well, I told you I have the Christmas idea about gift giving. This idea that a gift having to be explained. Because once the giver explains the gift, it makes sense. And I usually go, oh, yeah, that's it. And guess what? That gift becomes very special. It takes on a great value. Today's message is like that. When we consider our sinfulness, oh, I don't want to talk about that. But when I consider that and what God does with my sin, my transgressions, my iniquity, then I go, oh, I get it. I do have something to be grateful for. I do have something to be thankful for. So how do we respond? What is our response to the fact we are sinners and God takes our sin and deals with it? Verses 10 and 11 says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And here's the, the, the key verse for us. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Here in verses 10 and 11, it's the response of the one who has been forgiving. It's the response to the blessing of God's forgiveness. And it's worship. It's giving thanks. If we want to have that grateful heart, it's recognizing what God has done for us. Doing what we couldn't do for ourselves. Our gathering here today is called worship. Do you realize our worship, it's a response to God, who He is and what He's done. It's not, we're not here for entertainment. We're not even here to come to be blessed. It's not about us. It's about God and our responding to who He is and what he has done the grateful heart if you want the grateful heart you respond to God's blessings may we respond to God's forgiveness this time of year and throughout would you join me as we pray together father in heaven we do thank you for this time a time when we come together to acknowledge what you have done and who you are and Father, may we continue to worship you. May we continue to give thanks to you for your forgiveness. A forgiveness that was paid at such a high price. Well, Father, we love you. And we lift our hearts up to you in praise today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we worship in song? As we respond to God's offer of forgiveness if you've never experienced God's forgiveness today might be that opportunity for you will you deal with your sinfulness today will you bring it before him and receive his forgiveness do that here through prayer through song I'll be here at the front brother Bill will be over here to the side as well if you need to share with us need to pray with us please but most importantly, deal with this situation in your life.
with God. Sing the thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Oh, thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to to share something with you personal uh, I've missed you the past couple of weeks uh, I've been dealing with a little virus of sorts I say that tongue-in-cheek but yes I tested positive for the COVID virus um, uh, several weeks ago and fortunately for my family uh, I'm not a good patient fortunately for my family the symptoms were not that bad it was more like a sinus infection for me many that uh, are dealing with this it's not that easy I acknowledge the fact it was easy for me but um, during this ordeal and throughout this pandemic we've been dealing with there's a verse that keeps coming to mind to me it's Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 and this verse is one that came to me back in the spring as we started dealing with the virus, the uncertainty, the fear. But as this year has progressed and, the, you know, the unheard of, the unprecedented has happened, whether it's been the virus, whether it's been social issues, whether it's been the election and politics, this, fir this verse just keeps coming back to me. But it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of, of evil in the heavenly places. He says, we battle, we fight, not with one another, but with these other powers. And I've, the one thing I've taken from this year has been, it's been a year where we've become very disunified as a nation, as a community, and even as a church. Because a lot of our issues when it comes to the virus, politics, and social justice, we disagree on. And we have a hard time then after that. And it breaks us apart. Here, Paul was saying, it's not about us, but it's about us together fighting about, about this power of darkness. And so the reason I share this with you is because we have to stick together. I received a call this week. I received two calls on Thursday. I was working, finalizing the sermon, and they were very negative, heavy messages. And I just, it totally took me away from my study. And then one person called me, a third phone call came in. And the person, we discussed what all was going on. And they said, you know, we've got to do whatever it takes. We've got to stick together. And I was like, you're right. What a blessing it was to me at that point. So church, grace works. We've got to stick together. Even if we disagree, we've got to stick together. We've got to continue to pray for one another. Even though we might know, know what's going on in each other's lives, lift each other up in prayer because God does know. But let's make sure that we're in this together. Realize we've got to join together. Just a thought. It's not something, just one thing in particular that's happened in my life, but it's a thought that I think the church, we need to make sure we're very careful with as we, as we move forward into the future. We've got to stick together. Um, one other item I'll have with you is the fact that uh, our children meet at 1030. And I know this may not affect you, 
but uh, please help me keep that uh, hallway clear uh, and just keep that for parents and the children. And then I know Chip and Judy Liner have calendars for the upcoming year, a beautiful calendar of the cross, and so make sure you see them as you're exiting this morning. May God bless you. May you have a great week. Thank you all for being here this morning. Go ahead and stand up, and uh, uh, I'll give you one last uh, word on the way out the door. As you guys are heading out this morning, uh, if you uh, want to fill out a, a visitor's card out there in the hallway, they are out there. And once again, be sure to pick up one of those calendars on the way out the door. So good to see all of you this morning. Y'all have a wonderful day, and we will see you next Sunday. If we don't see you sooner, happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Bye-bye. Blessings, name them one by one. Here we go. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Oh, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Sing.